Okay, so it's my my pleasure to have today and Andreas Winter from the Université Autónoma de Barcelona, and today we're going to talk about quantum heat and Markov model. So, please, Andreas, take it away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the thanks for asking to give the seminar. And of course, sorry for not being able to be there in Singapore. It's it's been a while <laughs> that I haven't uh, seen the equator. Um, good to see so many of you at the same time. And, uh, and thanks for sending Josep to us. He goes together with uh, Marco Fanitza, who is our postdoc here. Uh, we, we started uh, reviving some of the questions from this paper, which I'm going to talk about mostly. It's a paper that's already a few years old with Alex Monras. The reference is down here. I hope you can see the cursor. If you don't, if you don't see anything, then uh, then tell me. Um, yeah, so I will not, I mean, maybe you see that there are like 80 slides. That's because there's a lot of additional material. I will not talk about all of it. I want to focus on some theoretical aspects of this, of this hidden Markov model and, um, and particularly the things uh, that, that, well, I hope to get to the things that, that Marco and Josep have been discussing lately, which is still work in progress. So, so uh, let's. Uh, Let's get started, perhaps. So, so yeah, we hope the slides are going forward. So I want yep, to start yeah. with, a, with sort of a bit of a broad question, which is uh, how how what does it mean to explain a, a large data, in particular time series of observations, with a simple model? And uh, and so, like I said, the, the completely our, our, our mathematical framework is we are observing. A potentially infinite time series, and obviously we only see a finite chunk of it. And this U T, this is like what we see at time T. That's letters from a finite alphabet. So I call this M here. I don't know why it was M, but I guess it comes from the patient from the paper. Um, uh, to make sense of this, because we only see a finite chunk of it, we have to assume some regularity on distribution already. And what we assume is stationarity, which means that. If we uh, to see a, a block of uh, a block of uh, uh, u1 to ul for a sequence, and, uh, like some people call it L point correlation correlation function, this is independent of the time where we start observation observing. So this is will be the same as ut ut plus one up to ut plus l minus one for all t and l. So that's that's when you think about it, it's the only way in which we can learn something about this joint distribution of this. Uh, of this long time series by observing only a finite part. And okay, so uh, again, when you think about it, it the, the, the distribution, of course, we are talking about the infinite sequence, but to describe this distribution, we only need to know it for those finitely, finite length words, U1 to UL, which I denote in computer science fashion M star. So this is the set of all finite length words. So in some way, uh, the information about what is the process, I mean, is we are not interested in the particular realization of, of use, but in the probability law behind it. That's kind of what we think is that's the theory behind it. That's an infinite set of numbers up here. So what does it mean to explain this in a simple way? And so one simple way could be that actually P of U is generated by some hidden cause that has only a finite memory. Uh, which we don't see, so the hidden, it's, it's a hidden memory. This, the, these are these are symbolized with these X's here. These are some entities. They are transformed over time, and in each time step, the obs uh, the X obs uh, determines what U we are observing. And so of course we need to specify the nature of this causation and of the memory. Um, but I mean, I, uh, before going into the mathematics, I want to say that there is kind of a famous quantum mechanical experiment, which was pioneered by Serge Roche many years ago already, uh, which is of this type. So this, the observations in the experiment are generated by a sequence of Rydberg atoms. So they're generated here in this kind of, this, this kind of box. They, they are, it's designed such a way that they come out very rarely, sort of with a more or less regular pace. Uh, in each in each time bin, there's there's going to be at most uh, one of those atoms. Um, the data the user observe are generated here at the end. So they fly through this apparatus, these atoms, these uh, atoms or ions, and then they they are observed here. And what happens is that 
In here, there's this cavity. That's the, that's the physical mechanism for the memory. There's, I guess, the cavity has a, several modes of resonance. They stay there, but while the atom flies through it, they, they interact. And so each, each atom leaves some kind of trace in, this, in the state of the cavity, uh, goes out, and, uh, and is observed. And then the next atom interacts with the cavity in the state that was prepared by all the previous atoms. And it's modified, its state is modified, it's going to be, it ends up being correlated with the cavity, and then it goes out. So these other, these yellow bits, these are control mechanisms, if I remember correctly. These are, this is where Arosh uh, modif can modify sort of by hand the state of the, of the atom as before it goes into the cavity and then it comes out. But think of this as part of the station. I mean, this is all stationary, the generation of the Ritzberg atoms. This part, this could be just a fixed intervention. Each time there is an atom, it does something to its state. And the memory is here. And, uh, okay, so he used this literally to learn something about the state of the cavity. Right? By inferring, like knowing, having a complete quantum mechanical description of the system, observing those atoms when they come out here, it allows you to infer something about the initial state of the cavity. So we are in a bit of a different situation. We think of the... The, this uh, internal system is really being unaccessible, and maybe we don't really even have a complete theory of it. So this is where we are going. So this is going to be a little bit philosophical. But let's start with a, with a simple case. I mean, hidden Markov model is a topic from classical probability theory. And so there, the, the hidden causation process is, is just said. So there's a finite Markov chain uh, with state space x. is xt there from this finite set x. And... Um, and, uh, and we have a, a map, a stochastic map, that takes the in internal state X to a new state X and an output symbol from A, right? So we kind of, this is what B does. It takes in an XT, it outputs XT plus one and UT plus one, with a certain, with a prescribed probability distribution that depends on X. And so when you only look at the Xs, that's a Markov process, and the Us are stochastic functions of this process. That's what a hidden market process. Um, uh, to prepare for the, I mean, it's kind of prob probabilistically, that's kind of a nice way of talking about it. We just have a single stochastic map. Um, we can also ch chop it up into stochastic maps that only talk about the, uh, the hidden memory, the axis, namely by post selecting on the use. So if I post select B on a, on a particular uh, output symbol UT, or U, then I get a substochastic map that maps X to X, or rather probability distribution on X to probability distribution on X, in such a way that if I sum them all up, then I get a stochastic map, which is this D bar, this is obtained from D by simply tracing over M. Simply, I mean, the, pro the probability on M is simply, I simply summed over. Um, so this this du this has this has the uh, nice feature that these are kind of they can, they are they figure as events. I mean they, they they are transformations on the state space of the axis, but also they they record the different output symbols. So this is kind of the operation that it takes to output a u. And uh, well, of course, it's probability theory. So what d bar being stochastic means is that it it preserves the um, the, the unit vector that's kind of the, the, the preserves the probability and it has a, a, a stationary distribution pi and so I'm just going to warn you here hopefully uh, maybe maybe not for the first time that I'm using here um, probability theory in particular Markov chain notation where the, the matrices the stochastic matrices they act I mean, they are normal matrices. They're just multiplied by normal matrices, but they act on probability distributions which are denoted as row vectors. So to multiply correctly, we have to put the row vector on the left. And the unit vector, that's a column vector of all ones. This is basically to say, oh yeah, what's, what's the probability of this? And so that sums all the entries. That's, that acts on the right. So why is that? This is a notation that's, I mean, it's a convention very, very common in, in stochastic processes because it allows us to read the process from left to right. So we read pi is prepared, it's the initial state, then du1 happens, then du2 happens, these are transformations, and then dul, and then we multiply with a unit, which is 
which gives us the probability of seeing u1, u2, ul in that order. And yeah, so if you if you follow your mathematician's instinct and say, oh, my probability is a column vector and the trace, so to speak, or the probability evaluation is a, is a row of ones, then everything is exactly the opposite way around. And you, you are, you always have to, uh, kind of, when you read your formulas, the time you have to read from the right to the left. Sorry about that. But again, this is inherited from the paper. Oops. Um, so that's a classical, mem uh, uh, classical memory. So what happens in the Hiroshi experiment if you have a quantum memory? Well, of course, it means that the internal state of the system has to be a quantum state for a well-defined system. We have a Hilbert space H, and the XTs, they come from the state space of this. And B is simply a completely positive instrument. So now you see why it's actually quite nice that we have introduced these DUs, because each DU is a completely positive map. It's trace non-increasing in such a way that the sum of them is a um, is a unital completely positive and um, and uh, well it's a it's a unit is a completely positive and unit preserving <clears throat> so again this is i mean for in, in for quantum information our instinct tends to be to work more in the schrodinger picture or in a picture where the maps transform the states and not the observables it turns out that this is actually a slightly more, this is a slightly more, again, for the notation, it's a bit nicer that the, that the maps act on the observables. So we can kind of, if we start now on the right, we, we apply the map to the identity, but then we have to start with the last one and go and go left uh, and, and apply. And in the, in the first one, the, the, the first time step is applied last. And then we compose it with the state, which is, a function. And so mathematically, it's going to evaluate the state, which is a linear function, on du1, which is evaluated on du2, blah, 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 and this is applied to 1. Um, yeah, so I, again, so in quantum mechanical lingo, I think what this would be that we are dealing in, <coughs> in, um, in like Heisenberg picture here. So it just allows us to write down the uh, it just, I mean, it's, it, it, it doesn't change anything about the, about the dynamics. I still want to think of the dynamics of flowing forward. It just allows us to write this notation. <clears throat> I guess you, you want the trace there? Or, no, or you just omega, see that as an inner product? Omega is just a function. Omega is, I mean, a state is just a, yeah, of course, I could also Oh, write, OK, OK, yes, I, yes. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I've... Um, I wanted to have the paral parallelism with it. Okay, so I, yeah, yeah. Just evaluate a linear function on the final thing. So it's a, yeah. It's a function of omega, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. And you could think of omega also as a density matrix and you multiply with omega and take the Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I realized that this talk is evolving over time a little bit. So I kind of, I, I, tried, I, I tried to stay close to the paper with Alex, but at the same time, I want to make the notation that was heavy. <laughs> Um, anyway, so the good thing about having this particular notation with the composition is that when you go back to the paper of uh, Fanes, Nachtagale, and, um, and Werner about finitely correlated states, that's exactly the formula they use, except that theirs is a bit more general because they don't insist that the, that the state is a probability distribution. The state is a quantum state. It's a multi-party quantum state, and our state is a basically a diagonal state. So it's a special case of a finitely correlated state because we we only have um, classical outputs of this, this unit. And yeah, so I would say this is a good description. I mean, this is kind of a, a, a faithful description of what what um, what Harosh does in, in this experiment or what people have done in similar experiments. So. And so yeah, now let's start abstract a little bit. So what's going on here is that we have I mean, what's the common feature of the quantum and the classical realization? Actually, let me go back a little bit about this. The, the, there's a bit of there's a bit of terminology here from the literature. We call this a completely positive realization because we have positive elements and we have completely positive maps that generate the probability distribution. And the classical realization is also in the literature often called a positive realization because we have vectors with positive entries and positive matrices. At, I mean, entries is the positive, matrix is the positive entry. So this here, what I'm going to write here, this is called a quasi-realization. 
And it's just, all it does, it reserves this linear structure that we have a, a vector space, a real vector space. We have a collection of linear maps and uh, such that when we sum them, they, this map has a fixed point tau in the vector space and the fixed point omega in the dual space. Oops, why is it? Oh, this should be a, ta a pi. I guess I wanted, okay, the omega was the quantum state. Now I just call it pi again, the probability evaluation. Um, yes, it's, it should be, a, this omega should be a pi. So if I apply d bar from the left to tau, it is preserved, so that's kind of our unit. And if I apply pi on the, on the uh, if I apply d bar on the right of pi, then I, or if I compose it with pi because it's a linear function, then I get pi. And normalization of probability is that pi of tau is equal to one. That, if that is given, then we can write down this expression in the green box. Pi evaluated on du1, du2, dul applied to tau. This could be a probability distribution. I mean, at least it's designed in such a way that this, if I sum all of these, if I, if I look at a fixed L and I sum the P over all words of length L, I get one. What I don't get guaranteed is positivity. It's, I mean, it's just linear functions, it's just linear vector spaces in the duals, so it could be anything, any real numbers. Uh, and in fact, um, it's a, in some sense, it's a bad idea to start from this general linear description in the first place, because if I just give you these elements, tau, pi, and those maps, it is actually undecidable whether p, this p that I get here is always positive or zero. It's a, it's a classic undesirable problem. Um, so why, do, well, okay, we, why don't we have this problem in, in quantum and classical? Um, you might say it's because of probability theory or because of Born's rule. Those guarantee that if you compose the quantum mechanical elements in the correct way, we get genuine probability. So we come back to this a bit later, but maybe you want to think about it right now. So before we go on, I want to go on an example. I mean, this is maybe the most, this is the point of pride of the paper. It's an example that kind of, we have a single example which we discussed like eight times in the paper. So this is, it was kind of fun to design that. So our vector space is simply all the, um, uh, all the qubit um, observables. Uh, the tau is the familiar identity and pi is the maximally mixed state. So it's a normalized trace. And then we have some maps. So when you look at them and let's ignore the p factors at the moment, for the moment, those are needed so that when you sum them, we get a, a trace preserving map. Uh, we have here a projective measure, projecting here and one. We have a unitary rotation around X and then around Z, and we have a transpose. And all these are, um, uh, well, the transpose is of course not a completely positive map, but when you, when you uh, I mean, this is just a quasi realization. I mean, this is not the whole thing, the quantum realization. Um, so what happens is that when a alpha and beta are incommensurate with pi, then the dynamics explores the whole block sphere. Why? Because um, the dynamics at some point will apply the projection to zero, for example. It will, that means the state will be prepared in the zero state. And then there is some probability, although it's small, that I have some prescribed sequence of X and Z rotations. And by, um, by, for example, Cardano or Euler's uh, decomposition, I can reach every uh, point on the sphere from a given starting point by a sequence of X and Z rotations. Of course, the rotations are by fixed angles, alpha and beta, but because they're incommensurate, they can approximate every desired angle to arbitrary degree. And so this is a four-dimensional quasi-realization. We can prove that it requires, however, two qubits to make a completely positive realization. I don't want to go into this. The reason is that we need to do something about this transpose. We need to make sure that this is represented by a completely positive map. Um, so why, well, let's go back to the initial motivation. Why do we, would, would we want to uh, um, kind of start from uh, uh, an observation and a sequence of observations and infer something about the, the hidden causation rather than Arosh who has a complex model of what's actually going on. All he does is infer some few parameters there. Um, I mean, one thing is, one motivation explained in a series of paper by Robin Bloom, Kohut and others, 
they, where they call this kind of self-consistent tomography, where you where you uh, want to certify a bunch of gates, measure, state preparation and state measurement devices collectively without assuming any kind of um, gauge for or, or calibration for any of those elements beforehand. So all you can do is plug them together in different ways and observe statistics. And then from that, you would like to say, oh yeah, this is this is consistent with the idea that I have that I have a state preparation uh, on the zero state, I have single qubit gates, so and so up to some precision, and uh, and I have certain measurements. And um, and so they, they they came up with this project as an as an attempt so that computer scientists can kind of certify what's going on in a in a supposed quantum computing implementation without actually studying any of the experimental details because none of us knows how to interpret a state preparation device how how do I know that it does what it's supposed to do or a measurement device or or, or the, well, the gates are usually the ones that we want to certify assuming that we can prepare given states and we can measure sigma x sigma y and sigma z. <clears throat> Okay, let's, I will not talk so much about these practical aspects today. I mean, I, there are some slides here, but I, I just gloss over them. Um, uh, what we uh, what we have here, I mean, I, I used this notation already before for this U bar, that's kind of a generic string. And the mapping from U bar to D U bar, which is just the composition of these maps, that's, uh, that's generally a semi-group representation. Of course, it could be nice and it's a group representation, then there is much more known. But this is really, really not the case that we're interested in because we want to have some kind of this U should really give some non-trivial information about the system. Um, yeah, so let's go back to the to the to the positivity of probability. In classical and quantum case, um, like I said, this is somehow built into the formalism. So what is this part of the formalism that does this for us? It's a vector space order abstractly. So what we have is in both cases, in the classical probability theory and in quantum theory, we have a, a convex cone, a pointed spanning cone, C in V, and, a, and, a, and another cone, C tilde, in the dual uh, cone, which is contained or something even equal to the dual cone, C prime. Do I have this written down here? Yes. So the dual cone is simply the, the convex cone of all functions that are positive on all elements of C. Um, such that tau is an element of C and pi is an element of C tilde, and the cones are preserved by the transformation. In fact, I mean, what's this cone in the quantum mechanical case? This is the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. So the, the state space, the, the density matrices, it's a subset of those. The, the observance is another subset of those. And the uh, by some, it's kind of built in by definition because we say we want that the, the transformation is completely positive. In particular, it preserves the positive cone, the positive semi-definite cone. And, uh, and by this duality here, by this definition down here, the, the probability law will be with this positive number. And in the case of probability theory, it's even simpler. The vector space is basically some R to the B. And the convex cone is simply all the vectors with non-negative entries. So, so the, the subset of those are the probabilities and also the random variables that we want to consider. Um, so one thing that we that Alex and I had to learn that wasn't really so obvious from the literature. I mean, they've dwelled on. We learned. We learned from the from from these old papers that positivity is undecidable. If I just give you a quasi realization, but if you somehow know that the probability is indeed positive for all u or zero, then um, then such cones exist. Yeah. So so such cones e and c tilde contained in c u l exist. Why? Because we can just uh, define C to be the cone generated by all by by the unit by tau and all the D maps, but the, there are infinitely many because I need to apply all finitely long words to them. So I, I generate the cone, and then I need to take the closure. I mean, this is a convex cone in a finite dimensional vector space, so the closure is just the usual thing that you take limit points. And C tilde could be 
this one here. This could be simply the cone of, we do the same thing. We apply the D maps to the, on the right to the pi, to the, to the dual vector and uh, take, take the cone generated by those and the closure. And uh, I call this cone, the first cone, the C min cone and the second one, the dual of the C max cone for reasons that should become obvious at some point. Um, I mean, okay, so C min, for example, every, every, uh, every cone that we want, we want to consider that contains tau must contain C min because the cone has to be uh, stable under the D maps. So with, with tau, we also need to buy in all of those DU applied to tau and the same for the C, C tilde. This is somehow, these two cones are the smallest ones that we potentially can consider. So if C tilde is containing the dual of C, then we're fine. And the positivity of probability is exactly that. It guarantees that C tilde is contained in the, in the, in the, in the dual of uh, C. <clears throat> so those cones are not unique. That's one of the problems of the undecidability. You have to find this cone. So this is kind of this undecidability of the P larger or equal to zero of Sontag. That is really about uh, finding or, or excluding the possibility of such pair of cone, convex cones. Um, okay, so uh, let's uh, let's switch gears a little bit. So, when, if you want to try to reconstruct v from the probability law, this is kind of this. I will just do a little bit of linear theory and, and forget about this positive cone for the moment. So, let's assume we have a genuine probability distribution. Then we can make then we can form uh, this matrix that has row and columns indexed by finitely long words u and v, u bar and v bar. And the, and this, the entry is simply the probability of u juxtaposed or concatenated with v. And so that means, of course, it's just the probability of a long word. Uh, and since I can chop this long word into two in, in many different places, this same number is repeated many times in the, in, the, in, the, in the matrix. In particular, it's repeated in the entries where the uh, row index is the empty word and the column index is uv and the other repetitions when the row index is uv and the column is the empty word. And so the, the, the reason why we write this kind of this Hunkel type matrix is this the symmetry of, of repeated entries. That's the, that's the Hunkel type matrix. Uh, the reason why we do this is because if the process has a quasi section of finite dimension of dimension D, then the Hunkel matrix has rank at most D. And the reason is here, and I write it like this here. So I write, if I simply write the probability law here as an as a inner product between a vector from the vector space and a co-vector from the co-vector space, both of them have dimension D. That means, I mean, whatever those vectors are, this is some kind of, a, 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 how will you call this? It's a bigram matrix. So I have just a bunch of vectors and they form all the possible inner products with a bunch of co-vectors. The, the rank of such a matrix, however many vectors have, is bounded by the dimension of the space from which I take that. Okay. But it's deep. And so if P has a co complete uh, positive realization with S states, then the dimension will be S because I will just take probability theory. If it has a completely positive realization with Hilbert space dimension P, then D will be P squared. Because I have to go to matrix, matrix, dimension matrices. Conversely, if I know that the rank of H is finite, I mean, this, we see this is now, this is a necessary condition for having a finite quotation, a finitely, a finite size quantum model or a even classical model. If, even if that is true, that is not a guarantee that a positive or even a completely positive realization exists. So the, the first examples are from the 60s and early 70s for, for the positive realization. And uh, for a completely positive realization, uh, the paper with Alex has a uh, example. Alex, how am I doing with time? Um, you still have like 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So this should, this should be fine. So, um, so what we do have yeah. is if the rank of H is finite, then there does exist a quasi realization with a vector space of dimension R. That's what you have. This is kind of the, and this is a fact of linear algebra only. This, this is the minimum dimension by the previous argument. If we have a smaller dimensional V that generates the same process and the rank of H would be actually smaller than R. 
And there is kind of a beautiful theorem about this, about this minimal dimensional uh, quasi realizations, namely that they are all similar to each other. And they're all I mean, up to a similarity, it's just the invertible linear transformation uh, com communicates between one and the other. So in some sense, they are, they are unique. Uh, the construction, I give it in a suitable generality. This is not useful for the actual reconstruction, but let's assume you have the full process with all these infinitely many numbers. You can arrange them in this infinitely long big matrix. So it has infinitely many columns, each of them infinitely long, uh, infinitely many entries. V is defined to be the column space of H. Well, this is they're, they're very, I mean, they're cumbersome to write those vectors, but we assume that the range of H is R, so that means the column space is a subspace of, dim of dimension R. And DU maps a column HV to HUV, which a priori you think, well, this is another column. How is there a linear map? Well, you, when, you, when you use the Hunter condition, you see this is actually what it does. It just selects a subset of rows. It simply picks out certain elements from this long vector and throws away the others. And so that's a linear map. You have to again, you check that this, so these are linear maps and you check that it works together with tau being the, the first column, the one with the empty word, and pi being somehow the trivial vector that has one in the beginning and zero everywhere. And you just uh, plug it all together and it, and it works. I mean, this is not a practical reconstruction because you, you don't want to manipulate an infinite matrix, but uh, that's fine. Yeah. So, sorry, there's, so, sorry to interrupt. Like in yes, the previous yes. slide, what do you mean by similar? By similar. Ah, similar in the in the linear algebraic sense. That, for example, the matrices are conjugated by, ah, okay. by a linear transformation. Right. Ah, right, right, right. Two. Two quasi realizations. One lives on a on a on a vector space v one. The other one in v two. They have both of them of the same dimension. Similarity means that there exists an invertible linear transformation between the two that maps the the d's and that maps the uh, the vectors uh, that maps the vector tau and the co-vector pi to the corresponding object in the other quasi realization. I mean, right. sorry, I didn't write this. Um, no, no, no. Then. I mean, no, they're, isomorphic. they're isomorphic in the linear. Right, right, yes, yes. Cool, no thanks. Um, the paper has it written in formula, so forgive me. <laughs> um, the finite dimensional regular representations somehow, well, quasi realization somehow explain the time series by a hidden mechanism, which is not classical or quantum necessary, but it's a general probabilistic theory. What's the general probabilistic theory? Nowadays, many people know this in our field. Um, uh, well, if, if, if you take the regular one, this is actually very nice because, because then C and C prime are automatically pointed and generating code. So they are full dimensional and they also have a supporting hyperplane. Uh, the unit is not just contained in C, but it's in the interior of C. So in fact, it, 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 that's how it defines a supporting hyperplane for the dual cone. And S is all the functions from the dual cone, which evaluate one on tau. This is like to say like trace of omega is equal to trace of omega is one. This is the state space. And the effects, so the, the, to build the measurements, you look at the intersection of C with tau minus C. So there's a, so there's a cone and you intersect it with the, the opposite one. Those are those, this is what you describe, what you need to describe effects. And this kind of, that's the kind of language and formalism that was uh, initiated by Ludwig among others and uh, Mackey in the sixties. And yeah, by now in foundations of quantum mechanics, it's a very, it's still a very active and popular topic. People try to, try to kind of come up with different GPTs that have features markedly different from quantum mechanics. And so, yeah, so what, what happens is we can, for example, write state, we can, we can actually write a state uh, uh, an, an element of S at time T and, uh, and those maps that we consider, they describe um, how we move from FT to FT plus one and at the same time output an observation U. So we, can, we have a, a theory of instruments. So what is necessary for this is that DU preserves this cone C, so it maps C to C. And then we can write down a formula like this. Composing FT with DU leads not to a state, it leads to a state multiplied by a positive number. This positive number we interpret as a probability of C and U. 
and then we are left with a normalized, renormalized state at t plus one. Or, I mean, sent the wrong generalized state. No, I mean, he sent the wrong one. Uh, Was it a question? No. Um, yeah, so to the extent that, I mean, some people in our field or in quantum foundations, they entertain these ideas sometimes that okay, there might be another theory with a different state space than quantum mechanics, but described by a GPT. They would say, okay, this this is now, this will be the state, right? We, we have to treat this as somehow the new reality if this becomes our future theory. Um, for the moment, I mean, in general, this is just a mathematical construct, an element in the context set generating a cohen So, um, uh, one uh, reconstruction problem that we could that we could identify that we are still investigating is this inference problem. So given given um, given the observation of the process, find a part of the Hankel matrix, not all of it because it's infinite, and and in particular find a regular representation, find the regular representation or any quasi representation for this vector space V, tau pi, and the maps du. Um, so the, the reason why this is sort of an interesting immediate question is that this, this is finitely a finite set of data. So the, the process is an infinite series. It contains infinite many correlations up to the argument is an infinite object. It's not very useful. This is a finite process. Once you have that, then you can start working on it. You can face the question if there is a quantum or a classical. Okay. Maybe that was also just a matter. Um, yeah, so this is, I mean, we are very, we have, it looks like we are very, being very modest. All we want is some of these GPT realizations, but, but um, or even just a linear representation without the quality of the But for example, I mean, why this can be useful is once you have that, um, uh, for a classical realization, knowledge of age, which is somehow encoded in this finite ele uh, element B tau pi and du. This is, is enough to construct the so-called epsilon machine, uh, which is a kind of a specific kind of memory model, which can could easily be infinite, that was pioneered by Crutchfield. Um, I just mentioned, I mean, this is not even the most useful thing for, for a classical hidden Markov person. Um, but even this, as far as I know, we don't have a quantum analog of that. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so then there is kind of a bit of discussion on, on, uh, on what it would mean to reconstruct those, this quasi realization, because we will only observe finite statistics. So we will see some expectation values of this hunting matrix exactly or rather with finite precision. And so we would like to find the kind of a rank R completion of IH or some big chunk of it uh, subject to the constraints that the entries are positive. And then we have this Hankel, then we have this Hankel matrix. Um, so I I gloss over this because I want to get to this other part. So like we don't have, I mean, this is work in progress. So we, we um, I left the slides in here. So we know pretty much what kind of sub matrix we need to uh, find, like which size of sub matrix we need. So that we can actually do the same uh, uh, linear algebraic argument of the row of the column spaces of the column space and, and, and reconstruct the maps, um, and then the hope is still that we could use some kind of low rank matrix completion technique, throwing in the positivity and the linear constraints from the Hunting matrix to get a, a, a reconstruction of the, of the matrix, and then from that we would get all the elements from the quasi-realization. And if that doesn't work, most likely it means, well, if the algorithm fails, then it most likely it means that our assumption of the rank was, was too optimistic. We have to increase the rank and increase those sets S and T and we can, we can, we can run the algorithm again. But we don't, I mean, the algorithm we can, I could describe it, but it's a bit pointless because we don't have no guarantee on, on how, how well it will behave. Um, so, it, I mean, it would not be much more than saying, oh, yeah, just sample the probabilities long enough until you know them with sufficient precision, and then just do the linear algebra. And this, I, don't, I don't have any guarantee that my, my would be algorithm is any better than, than a sort of a partial tomography. 
So let's go to the last part, which is um, how, how can we see from the statistics whether it admits or doesn't admit a classical, but a quantum uh, hidden Markov model. I mean, with a finite memory, or that it admits a finite memory, finite size GPT memory, but not a quantum. <clears throat> And so for that purpose, it's actually quite good to go to this minimal dimension of quasi realization among all of them. And it's kind of, that's isomorphic to this regular representation. Um, there are different ways of, of obtaining this. And one of them is to start from, the, from your favorite quasi realization, for example, from a probabilistic one or from a quantum mechanical one, and then factoring out dark subspaces in, uh, of states and observables. So the, the, the dynamics, in general, because we, we start with some vector space, we have a, we have a vector in the vector space is tau, and then we apply those maps. A priori, it's not guaranteed that this map will explore, those maps will explore the whole vector space V and in the sense of span. And the same with the dual vector, this might explore a, a smaller subspace. And so we can we can factor out this redundancy, those, those, uh, those orthogonal spaces that we don't see. Um, then of course we, we get we, we get a new equivalent uh, linear representation, a quasi realization with a smaller dimension, with the smallest possible in fact, it will automatically lead to the uh, R dimensional quasi uh, regular representation. But it will not. I mean, even if, if we start from a quantum realization with uh, with density matrices and positive semi definite constraint, what we get will not look like that at all in general. And so what happens is that, for example, for the, uh, yeah, so to, let's go back to these positive cones. So what, uh, what we had was a very abstract description of what those cones might be from, the, from a positive or a completely positive realization. We also get stable cones, C and C tilde, namely by doing the same kind of uh, quotienting. Uh, in, in, I, had, I had some slides at the end of the talk uh, just in case, but I'm not showing this here. So just kind of removing this redundancy, we'll also project down the cones, the positive or the completely the positive semi-different cone to some other convex cone now in the regular representation. And so in the classical realization, uh, uh, this we start with a cone of non-negative vectors. And when we do this projection, this is literally what happens is that we are taking a subspace, we're intersecting this with a subspace, and we are projecting it into another subspace. These two are the operations. And this gives rise to a polyhedral cone. And this will be true both for the C and for its dual. And in the quantum case, we get a cone that is described as, in the literature, semi-definitely representable. So the general form of such C is, it's a vector. I mean, this, are, this we just choose a basis in our vector space such that there exist some other numbers, so that the following sum of xi times ri is positive semi -definite. And And the cone is simply described by this d by, d by d by d is a very large number, potentially, permission matrices ri. And the definition is a convex cone point, pointed at the origin. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, this is the kind of object that you get when you when you when you slice and project a um, the cone of positive semi-different matrices. So uh, in the previous example, we have a very very interesting case. We have no choice of the cone. We have we have designed the example in such a way that the the minimal cone and the maximal cone, which for which which are upper and lower bounds for any candidate positive cone describing the GPT in question, they are the same. And so C is unique and it is the block sphere. And so this gives a very simple geometrical argument why this process cannot be represented by a classical realization. Why? Because the classical, if a classical realization exists, then a cone can be constructed, which is a polyhedral cone. And it's at the same, state, at the same time stable under the under the set of maps. And this is simply not the case here. We have a, we have a sphere, um, a spherical cone with infinitely many external rays. And so um, 
So this is a process that can be written down very simply. It can be seen from quantum mechanics that it has positive probabilities, but it's not realizable classically. So this gives a, it's a very different uh, way to the examples given by Fox and Rubin and Dharmadikari in the 70s, 60s and 70s. In fact, our argument is purely geometrical. We're just looking at this cone and, uh, and argue that why, why a classical realization can exist. Um, so the, 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 the argument of these gentlemen in the past, they were very, very different. Um, and in fact, I think, uh, I mean, we, we analyzed together with uh, Giuseppe and Marco, we analyzed the example discussed of Dhamma Dikari, and it turns out it's not classical realization, but it can be, it has a quantum realization in, in dimension four, so the Q tree, sorry, in the Q tree, I think you need a Q tree. Um, so, so we you could consider maybe the same is possible for the quantum realization. I mean, what we know is that the, there must be an SDR cone that fits between C min and C max. And of course, in addition, it needs to be stable under the maps, but geometrically, there must be this SDR cone. So if we find a quasi realization, a process with a quasi realization such that C min is equal to C max, so the, the, post, the smallest and the largest possible cones are equal, and this cone is not semi definitely representable. This would prove that the, we have a process that can be built with a GPT, but not with a finite quantum realization. And so I just want to show you a few, like five minutes, uh, what, what, uh, what Marco and Giuseppe have been doing over the last two weeks. Um, and so the, it, it, it boils down to this here. There's, the claim is this, there exists a process um, with Hunkel rank three and such that the C min is equal to C max and this cone is actually transcendental. So which means what it means is that if you intersect it with a suitable subspace, the boundary is a transcendental curve. Actually, we will see it's an exponential curve. So it cannot be described by polynomials. And that's, that proves it because SDR cones, I mean, they are this, they are, they are cone condition is a positive semi-definiteness and that's an algebraic or a semi-algebraic condition and about you know, solution of algebraic equations. So they can take those boundaries cannot, we cannot describe transcendental curves. So how we do it is again, very much like Monras and, and myself, we actually don't give you the process in some kind of crazy way. What we describe is the quasi realization and because the rank is, uncle rank is three, we know that there must be a three dimensional vector space. You can, and so I'm just gonna, I'm just writing to you what this, uh, this should be D, what these D matrices are. So the output symbols are zero, one, and two. So we need a D zero, a D one, and D two. So forgive me that for some reason there are now M's. <laughs> um, uh, there are three by three matrices. Um, and so they, they look like this. So we need a number A larger than one. So we take put A here and then, and we have, and uh, so the matrices the a, a, a D1 and D2, they have this Jordan block form. We have a single eigenvalue A and a single eigenvalue D here. And then we have a non-trivial Jordan block with once in the diagonal and a zero here and an L and, and log A and a log D there. So what does it for us is, well, sorry, before we go on, M0 is of rank one. This is also, this came out from the study in Dharma Dikari, I guess, but it's probably not so interesting to, to the audience here. Um, it's just an outer product of a vector and a co-vector, which we have to choose in a, in a particular way. So why do we choose this uh, D1 and D2 uh, in, in this way? What happens is when we multiply them, right? We have to form words of zeros, ones, and twos. Let's look at a word only, as a sequence only of M1 and two. Well, okay, first of all, they, uh, they commute. In fact, this, writing this here, this A and this log A here, that's a representation of the um, multiplicative group. Yeah, so if you multiply those matrices, if I just write an M1 to the S, M2 to the T, or any kind of sequence where I have S uh, uh, D1s and S and T D2s, up here, because I just have a number, I get A to the power S, T to the power T. And here the, the off diagonal element in the, in the Jordan block, they add. They add with, with weight S times log A plus T log D. So I have, I have 
two representations of the, I have here in the, in the, in the matrix of multiplication, I have two representations of the multiplicative group of positive numbers, an ordinary multiplication and addition of the logs. And so we, if I choose the numbers A larger than one and B less than one in such a way that the logs are incommensurate in the sense that they are, that no rational linear combination can be zero, then these numbers here are dense in the reals if I vary over positive integers S and T. And so that means I can simplify this expression here, putting an arbitrary number X and an E to the X. And so this, I get, I get up to closure, I get, I mean, up to dense closure, I get all of these matrices. And so that allows me to write down the minimal and the maximal cone. The maximum, the minimal cone, or, I might have, I think I should have, well, actually, yeah, sorry, this is, yeah. you probably, you're probably not in a position to appreciate this, right? This should be, I think this should be the max, and this should be the, C, uh, this should be C max prime, because these are the states, and these are the, uh, these are the random variables. Um, never mind, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just applying these matrices to the, to which vector, to this, to this uh, vector here and this co-vector here, because when M0 happens, it, it uh, M0, what it does when you apply it to a, to a vector, it, it contracts it with mu zero and it prepares this vector M0. And, and vice versa, if you apply it, if you apply it on the left to a density, it contracts with the M0, so it gives a number and it gives a co-vector mu zero transpose, which is a constant. So this event zero resets the internal state to, depending on which way, whether you're working in Schrodinger or in Heisenberg picture to mu zero or n zero. And so it's, it's very natural that you see, okay, let's apply these matrices, these exponential matrices to, to mu zero and to m zero, and you get, get this here. And so, and, and I mean, I wrote here the dual of C max well, when you calculate it, what C max is, you find it's actually of the same form of C min, only that the parameters that you see here, these new parameters, they change. But it's kind of in the same family, three dimensional family of convex cones. And so it's possible to choose the mu's and the m's in such a way that C min is equal to C max, equal to C. And then you see that when you fix this value here, you have a line here, this varies over real numbers, and here you have an exponential function. So this cannot be algebraic. Uh, so if you, if you choose the mu's and the m's in such a way that the, the, these two columns are coincide, sorry, the c min and c max, this is the dual, then you can prove that it's possible to find a, a fixed point of, uh, of the dynamics in the interior of c and also a left fixed point pi in the interior of C prime, and this gives us the quasi realization. This defines, I mean, it's, it, these are just eigenvectors that are about solving certain linear algebraic equations. So I'm not going to give you those numbers, but uh, I mean, this is the general form. And this defines a process. It's by design, it's, it's such that the positive probabilities are positive. So it's a genuine stochastic translation variant process. And we just by looking at the geometry of the cone of states and observers, we can argue that this cannot have any quantum relaxation. In fact, um, instead it has a, a GPT, it's, it's given by a GPT where the positive cone is this weird object here, right? It's a cone that is somehow traced out by a, it's a cone generated by the graph of an exponential curve. <clears throat> um, and so, yeah, one question I would like to highlight because I should really close. Can these exponential cones be useful for something? I mean, one thing that struck me is that the dual cone of some such cone is, is of the same kind. So it's like, like, SD, it's like STP, like where, you, where your positive cone or the, 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 the positivity condition that you use to define your convex sets, it is the same positivity condition that you need to describe the dual problem. So this should somehow be good for convex optimization. Of course, the cone I gave you here is just a three-dimensional cone, so that's, that's not a theory. One would need a kind of a, a whole n-dimensional family of such cones. Um, 
what what I think should be interesting is exploring these uh, theories as GPTs. Uh, one reason is that like like um, like quantum mechanics, they have a lot of symmetry, but not on the level of the state space. They have the symmetry on the level of the of the cone of the positive cone. This this is all designed here in such a way that when you take a boundary point on the cone and apply one of those matrices, you get another bound. I mean, these are all invertible. So it's, it's, a, it's a group representation. And so you have a you have a you have a a certain transitivity property on the on the cone, on, uh, on the I'm sorry, on the boundary of the cone, on the extreme point of the cone. Mm -hmm. So they this this is some kind of a, a, a GPT that is very different from quantum mechanics, but it's it's it still has some kind of something which we say like in quantum mechanics, namely a large degree of symmetry. And uh, and I think that's the end. I mean, I should really stop. So the rest is just extra material. If you have questions, or that I can send you later on, if you want to see more of the talk. Well, let's thank the speaker then. Okay. Just yeah, just some time. Okay, just an hour. Yeah. Sorry, I took a bit longer. No, don't worry. Thank you for the nice talk. I mean, we have time for I guess one or two quick questions. If anyone has a question, please can unmute yourself or. Just write in the chat. I can I ask something? It's a sure go on. Uh, it's a bit of a vague question, but but if uh, sure. like when you have a this quasi quasi realization, and then you let's say you want to have a quantum realization out of it, and then you have these these linear maps, and you want to make it into a actual quantum yes. instrument. So yes. I suppose there are some conditions for this linear map, so you can actually extend them to like a to like a whole whole yes. quantum algebra. So so some kind of an extension conditions. Yeah, yeah. I, I know there are some conditions that have to be satisfied. But... Um, yes, and yes, and no. I mean, we um, yeah. So in fact, the. The purpose of the of the paper with um, with um, Alex was to to exhibit this. So, so the problem is that um, I mean the question is not at all vague. I mean, the, if there's anything vague about it, is the is the prob is the problem in, the inherent problem in it is um, if I give you a quasi realization, that's just this 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 is just a, a linear structure. So from what we know is this, I mean, let's be optimistic. It could, it could be the mi minimum dimension one. So that should would mean this is the quotient of a completely positive realization. There exists some Hilbert space. So there, there exists a, a realization with a vector space where the V is P of H and C is the positive semi cone. But I, I don't a priori know how large this Hilbert space might have to be. This is one of the problems. I mean, the example that we showed with with uh, Giuseppe and Marco is that what it boils down to is uh, what strongly suggests is that there, there are also quantum processes with finite rank where there's a quasi realization of dimension three, but where you have where you need arbitrarily large quantum dimension to represent it. I mean, classically, this is known from this from this literature of Gamma di Pari et al. There are processes uh, with a with a three or four dimensional quasi realization. So with a G, four dimension GPT, but you can design the dimension of classical state space to make a hidden Markov model. Then it can be arbitrarily large. Um, so this is the this is the main difficulty. But like if you do conversely, like the question you had was, what kind of structure do I need to see? If you if you start from a quantum model and you do this quotient thing, what you get is I mean, you, you want that your maps are city maps and your, your unit is the unit matrix and, this, and, the, and the pi is actually a quantum state, so the positive semi-limit is trace one. You can run through this, uh, through this uh, quotient in description. And so, uh, so we find that, okay, the positive cone that we find for our GPT is one of these SPR cones. And so the, 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 the nice thing is that also, um, also, the 
the maps once they kind of projection down to to the regular representation they become now maps mapping this sdr onto itself and the maps that we can obtain from a from a cp map so the maps that are a shadow of a cp map in the in the big unknown quantum model they are also an element in an sdr cone and so the conditions i mean the condition for the for the for the for the maps for the potential map du that i'm looking for if i say oh yeah maybe i maybe i guess what the correct quantum model is and what this projection might look like the eligible maps they, they are constrained by semi definite condition for each for each potential quantum realization so this doesn't this doesn't allow us to characterize and it still might be very difficult what it what it allows you to see is that ah this means that these maps are actually completely positive in the sense of operator systems because our SDR cones, because they are defined by semi-definite conditions, they, they automatically define an operator system. And so, um, so this, this set, this weird positive semi-definitely defined set P uh, that we have, it's definitely contained in the positive semi-definite for this operator system. Um, and so that, yeah, at least analytically, that that gives us some constraint. I mean, like it, I don't know how to use it in actual calculation. Um, the, uh, yeah, okay. So sorry. This is the the, the condition for this. These semi definite conditions they are not very nice. So we we call this cone the cockroach because it's so it's so ugly. You just you need to spend a long time with it to re to realize that it's actually quite natural. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but yeah, if you want, I mean, that's all I can say for the moment. And this, it's a big, big open question. Maybe also one of these unsolvable ones, given a quantum realization, how do you even see whether or not it has a quantum realization? Whether it is a quotient of a quantum realization? And if it is, how do you find one? Those are two unsolved algorithms from in, in full generality. Okay. okay. Thank you. Well, let's thank the speaker again then. Thank you for a nice talk.